Under the bright glare of the pool's lighting, at some point in the night, I had actually managed to fall asleep. Even with the frigid, light rain that had peppered my blast wounds, I didn't feel all too bad. I was lucky that the light gashes didn't bleed too much, or I would have been worried that brass might have gotten burned. But even so, I'm sure the rain was washing it out of the cage anyway. Backlash! We're going down! Brass whispered as he prodded me with his hoof, waking me up. I sat up quickly, rocking the cage lightly as we lowered to the street. The cold night air whipped around my mane as Brass pressed himself close to me, the both of us waiting to see what 42 had planned for us. But as we touched the ground, it wasn't 42 that met our gaze. It was the smiling face of Zeus Merdino. Hey, the next shift change for the factory is in an hour. He whispered as his horn glowed, floating a bobby pin and screwdriver over. If you get your things and wait, you may be able to slip out of town within the crowds. Thanks for this, but why? I asked quickly, my ears picking up the padlock on the cage, giving a soft click. You could have just left us for dead. Why risk it? Look, I know you gave me the advice to get out of town, but I hate leaving debts unpaid. His magic tugged the lock opening it and threading it out the door. I pushed the cage open slowly, Brass and I stepping out. He shut it and locked it again. Now go. If you're lucky, nobody will notice the cage is empty until you're gone. He looked over at a mechanical winch on the side of 42's tower, his magic cranking it quickly and raising the cage back up. Quit standing and go! He whispered hoarsely, his urgent tone making me flinch slightly. I nodded and looked around for Brass, Catching a glimpse of him already threading his way between the stools of Peppermint's bar, I hastily galloped after him, my rear legs now well enough that I felt the rusty braces were actually slowing me down as they chafed heavily against me. I'll just have to dump them when we gather the rest of our things. Running was probably something we'd need to do a lot of soon. As I made my way through the empty bar, I could hear Brass opening the door to Peppermint's office. Not even her bouncers were up. As I climbed the stairs, the gears in my head spun, and though that may be because she had died, they didn't exactly have any pony paying them, so they, their jobs probably didn't seem important until somebody else was put in charge. I turned the corner into the room, watching as Brass had already pulled our stuff out. I shut the door quickly, trotting over to him and looking over the bags. So what's the plan, Blacklash? He said, before biting down on his saddlebags. Attempted to swing them onto himself with little success. His voice told me he was extremely worried, but there was more than a trace of hope in it. He trusts that I can get us out. If he believes that, then I must get us through this. I hoofed his bags from him before le uh, leaning down and biting them. We wait. I managed to get out from around the straps, pushing them over and onto his back. Zeus's plan sounds all right. If we try to slip out in the confusion of the morning shift, we can be gone before 42 even knows what happened. I swung my head over and got my own saddlebags, swinging them on easily. But why not go now? Brass stomped his hoof on the floor, making us both cringe momentarily. 42 is always expecting us to play it safe. I hoofed at the buckles on my leg braces, cursing at the fact that the pre-war ponies never designed them for ease of use with earth ponies. But still, she thinks we're locked up. Going now would risk every pony seeing us, I said as I had the BEL box tucked neatly in the lid of the trunk our gear was in. I finally got the braces off, wiggling our, my rear hooves as I stretched them out a bit. It felt good to have my own legs back. Since when has 42 ever shown up when we expected her to? Brass put his hoof on my side his determined eyes looking over my own as the gears in my head tried to fight his logic. They spun for a good minute before stopping, giving me nothing. You're right. I sighed, hoofing the BEL box out of the chest, much to Brass's confusion. But, if she does show up, I want to make sure I have leverage to use. I bit down on the rope handle the box had, swinging it over onto my back. Brass hoofed my saddlebags open, guiding the box in. To my surprise, 
even with the interior expansion spell most saddlebags had. It didn't fit all the way in, as a good quarter of it was still sticking out. I looked back into the trunk, glancing over Zin's outfit. It served its purpose to get us inside the pool, but getting out wasn't something it could help us with, as we would stick out from the regular crowd. I shut the trunk and looked over to Brass, nodding as I turned with him towards the door. Well, here goes nothing. I murmured under my breath, opening the door slowly. We crept down the stairs carefully, making our way uh, as quietly as possible through the empty bar, crouching low behind the last row of tables as I perked my ears up, listening for any noise. Nothing but the rain. We sprung to our hooves, taking off at a gallop along the empty streets as a small smirk crossed my muzzle. Shit, this plan might actually work! I turned my gaze from the pink tower we were running past, and looked over to Brass, who had turned my grin with one of his own. He glanced in front of him, momentarily growing wide-eyed just before I bowled into some pony, tumbling into the pavement painfully in a mess of tangled legs. Hey, watch where you're going! The stallion yelled as we both scrambled back to our hooves. He stopped and looked between Brass and I, before pointing his hoof at me. Hey, wait, you're... He tried to say, but I panicked, spun and kicked out with my rear hooves hard, connecting them to his chest. He grunted and flew backwards, smashing through the old glass doors that were fitted into 42's tower. So much for being subtle! I barked out. As I got to my hooves, uh, run, Brass! I launched myself into a gallop. Brass barely keeping up as our hooves pounded the pavement hard. The gray cloud over of us I was starting to brighten as the sun rose before us, momentarily distracting me from the shouting and yelling that had erupted behind us. We bolted past the red lantern, my glance drifting to a stunning-looking Lil Zeus. Run! I called out between gasps, the gears in my head spinning as Brass and I bolted towards the bridge. The sound of shooting filled the air as bullets whizzed past us, striking the old bridge like dozens of ringing bells that only served to wake more of the residents up. Backlash! 42 screamed out from somewhere behind me, her agitation carrying even over the reports of her gang's wild, inaccurate shots. We aren't done, Backlash! It was hard to hear, but a slight amount of happiness came through her voice. Was she enjoying the fact I was escaping? I'll see you and your friends again soon! As Brass and I crossed the bridge, the shooting died down, leaving the echoes to drift about the mountainside. The gears in my head shoved the notion to stop and turn around down in my brain, and, as if I didn't have a say in it, my legs stopped me a few feet before the end of the bridge. Backlash! What are you doing? Brass asked as he panted heavily, skidding to a stop just past me. I shook my head and turned around using my hoof to drag the wooden BEL box out of my bag. Brass, I need you to keep going. No matter what, I need you to get to Red Wing. I watched as 42 and her pink-masked minions walked up the street, her muzzle twisted into, a middle, into an evil grin that I could see from here. I'm done with this stupid back and forth. 42 dies now. I'm not leaving you then. This is as much as my fight as it is yours, he said, watching me unlatch the tan box and swing the lid open. I felt such joy in beholding the rusty antique, the multi-shaded, prismatic green glow that the single balefire egg gave off it was like greeting an old friend. It was just the sight I'd wanted to see on a morning like this. I was about to speak up when I looked up. 42 was on her hind legs with an old hunting rifle in her hooves aiming at us. I raised my hooves and closed my eyes as 42's shot rang out, waiting for the sharp pain of a bullet to tear through me. But it was a pain that wouldn't come. In its place was a particular sensation of all the gears in my head feeling like they had all fell out of place at once. It wasn't painful or uncomfortable, but it was as if the pin holding them all in place simply gave way and they all tumbled down into nothingness. I opened my eyes when I felt tears streaming down my cheeks. My muzzle wore a smile that held no emotion to it. In my hooves, for some reason, now held the BEL ready to fire. It was pointed at the group across the bridge.
time and slow to a crawl, as it does whenever I'm ready to make a bad decision. And the BEL trigger clicked as I squeezed it. <clears throat> a single bullet cut through the air from Fortitude's rifle and punched through my right hind leg, dropping my flank only a moment before the heavy weapon activated. The new trajectory sent the prismatic egg high into the air, my, air follow uh, my eyes following it up until halfway along its arc, observing as 42's group did the same. But 42 herself was shrinking. No, she was dropping into a drainage pipe, which didn't make sense seeing as she would have to have known it would miss her and... 42's echo words echoed in my mind, like a haunting reminder that I should have paid attention. The pool contains all the magically charged flux for the machine. It splashed down into the pool of taint, making me grow wide-eyed as I turned towards the pony-sized boulder next to this end of the bridge. I did my best to get to my hooves to move, but a blinding light from the magically enhanced balefire egg detonated and forced me to go flat before even getting close to hiding. Much like last night, I felt the blast wave hit me, but along with the force of what felt like a hundred armored power hooves, came the familiar sensation of my coat on my left side blistering and burning. The light ringing from my blown hearing was the last thing I remember before blacking out. I blinked my one good eye as I realized I was standing on a hillside that I'd never seen before, and no idea how I got here. In an instant, my body also reminded me of the trauma the blast had caused, my entire left side flaring into agony as I let out a bellowing scream. My hooves gave out from under me and dropped me onto my good side as I clenched my jaw. The creaking of wood followed the uncomfortable feeling of laying on top of something odd. Backlash! You're alive! Brass said enthusiastically from next to me. His voice was comforting as it was... off. It was as if all the hope had been sucked out of it. I coughed and smirked through the pain, tilting my head up so I could see if he had been injured as well. Can't die yet? I haven't taken you home. I looked up at him, his beaming smile helping to dull the pain while he looked to be completely unhurt. How? How did we get here? You've been walking for the past hour. He sounded confused at how I didn't know that. I tried to pull myself to my hooves, grunting as I collapsed, as my cracked and blistered coat snu uh, stung against the bandages wrapped around me. About five minutes ago you collapsed and stopped moving, until you stood up a few moments ago. He continued as I only half paid attention. Wait, bandages? I just twisted to look at them, feeling my stomach churn as I violently threw up all over the dirt. It was a mix of yellowish fluid and blood informing me that I had some minor radiation sickness. Yeah, it looks like the last healing potion you had wasn't destroyed in the blast to fix your ears and your leg. Brass said with a sigh. And the bandages you had are what's keeping what's left of your coat attached to you. Well, at least you patched me up. I groaned as I took a few steps forward, pausing for a moment when a spike of pain shot through my head. Or, did I patch me up? I reached my hoof up and brushed my half-melted mane out of my vision as I rubbed my forehead. I felt a weight shift in my saddlebags, looking back to see that the BEL box had been placed back in it. You did, mostly because I couldn't have. His voice said sadly, his voice once again hollow. I looked over and looked at the scorched tip of his horn, remembering how his magic had been burned out yet again yesterday. You've helped out more than enough, Brass. You should take a break anyway. I looked around at the hills we were in, trying to find some sort of reference point to get a hold of. As I swung my vision back behind where I was facing, I saw a large black cloud rising in the cloud cover miles behind us. That was probably from whatever remained of the pool, and hopefully, 42. At least the whole fucked up incident was behind us, in more ways than one. You know she ain't dead. A s voice called out from in front of me. An all too dis disconcerted voice at that. How many times are you gonna learn before she that you're gonna learn before she ain't gonna go down easy? 
The dark, uh, the dusk stallion from the, my boat cabin, Dream, was speaking to me. But I was fairly sure that I was awake. Wasn't I? Was this actually all a dream? I looked around to where I thought I heard the noise, but only gazed upon the skeleton of a long-dead unicorn. No, no, no. You're not real! I couldn't help but giggle out. Finding the absurdity of the situation uncontrollably funny. As I laughed, I winced in pain, making me think that if this was a dream, it was far too vivid for my liking. Why, of course we're not! A proper sounded stallion that chimed in now. It would sincerely be quite worried if you indeed thought us to be substantial individuals. I turned again, looking at an old dead tree stump as it finished talking. But backlash? Bryce's voice fell into his concerned tone again. What's going on? Nothing, Brass. It's just hallucinations from injuries or something. I tried to brush it off, seeing as I don't need him worrying over my unstable mind. I'll be following as long as we get going. We need to get back to Red Wing for when Sky gets there. Brass galloped up in front of me, holding out his hoof as I saw he had a look of confusion and fear in his eyes. No. I asked because I hear the voices as well. His words making me freeze mid-step. Oh, honey. The disembodied voice of a mare spoke up from behind a large rock, causing Brass to jump almost as high as I did. I'm sorry about what happened. I know how hard it is on you this last month, but to have this happen, I don't know how you have the strength to carry on. She shouted genuine. Her words gave me a small amount of comfort. But she wasn't real. None of them were. I shook my head and stomped my hoof in the dirt quite painfully. Maybe I should use my non-cooked uh, leg next time. Come on, Brass. You just have to ignore them. I watched as he nodded and turned around. The two of us continuing forward the three imaginary ponies whispered to themselves. Keeping an ear back as we walked, I waited till a few minutes after their voices faded to strike up conversation again. As I went to speak, Brass held up his hoof in alarm and perked his ears. I stopped and turned mine forward. It was a voice. No, multiple voices. All of them shouting in anger. Brass looked back and waved his hoof for me to follow, and I did, doing my best to stay quiet as we lowered ourselves down and crawled to the next top of the hill. The first thing to catch my eye was a pair of large broadcast dishes that sat perched on the mountainside nearby a thousand feet away. One of them was tilted nearly straight up and had various sheet metal structures built onto it, while the other looked like it was still functional, almost like it had been maintained and repaired over the years. But why would anyone do that when the only radio any point it listens to is DJ Pone 3s? As my good eye looked down at the impressive buildings, I noticed a small group of about ten ponies shouting angrily at a dark gray mare who was quickly trotting in our direction. I pushed myself down the side of the hill and painfully rolled onto my back. There is nowhere to hide, and neither Brass nor I are in any condition to fight. Fucking amateurs. I could hear the mare murder as she continued towards us. I looked over to Brass for a suggestion, receiving only a shrug. So what do they think my ideas are wrong? I can kill off a character if I want to. I could hear her hoof steps crunch on the loose rocks from the other side of the hill. Oh crap. If she kept going, I need to move. They just... She was cut off mid-sentence as her hoof caught on mine when I tried to pull it out of her way instead tripping her. She stumbled forward and screamed out in surprise, scrambling back to her hooves. The fuck did I- She cut herself off as she looked up on me, quickly realizing that was some random pony before backing up quickly. What the fuck do you want from me? She cringed and shrunk down, putting a forehoof over her face. Don't worry, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to trip you. I was just curious to what all the shouting was about. I tried my best to be quick with my response. Not wanting to scare the poor mare, mostly because I needed her help. That, and I'm lost. I need to know how to get back to Red Wing. It's dire that I return. The mare looked me over suspiciously as she lowered her hoof. So, you aren't a crazy fan out to kill me? She asked slowly, 
One of her eyes tinging as part of her gray mare drooped across her face. A crazy what? A crazy what? Brass spoke at the same uh, moment that I was thinking it. Look, we just went through hell to save Red Wing and nearly got ourselves killed when the pool exploded. We just need to get back to our friends. She looked at me with an air of uneasiness, getting back to her hooves defensively as her body read that she was ready to take off running. Okay, not a fan, but still a bit crazy. You keep bringing up fans. Why is that? My curiosity peaked. I now felt that I needed to know that before anything else. I hate the way my mind never has its priorities straight anymore. The mayor looked offended at the question. Dropping her defensive stance and placed her hoof on her chest. I am solemn. She nearly shouted. Her face beamed with an air of pride, shrinking down as I sat in silence. I honestly had no idea who that was, though for some reason the name sounded familiar. Solemn? The author? She continued, her reaction shrinking the longer I sat in silence. She sighed and faced hoof. Solemn, author of After School Equestria, A Teacher's Passion? It's an extremely popular radio play that I've been doing for years. She face hoofed as she finished. It probably would have come to me faster had my head not been killing me, but I finally remembered. Oh shit! I felt a smile drive across my muzzle. Uh, I love that story. My outburst made her gaze shoot up in concern. My buddy Ripcord had me rig up his audio, a radio to an audio log recorder so I can listen to them any time I was in town. Solemn's face went from concern to a nervous smile. So, you are a fan then? Brass was bouncing on his hooves next to me as he spoke. You bet your flank we are! Been waiting for the next chapter to be put out so I can finally hear what happened to Cheerley's affair was aired through the school's PA system. But it's been months since the last broadcast. Brass stopped and put a hoof on his chin. I don't suppose you can tell us when you'll be finished with it. She sighed and sat down. There's no next chapter. Her words sounded like Brass, only had minutes earlier, telling me that she felt defeated. The others who helped me with the production have their own ideas about how the story should progress. To be honest, I can't say that their ideas are any worse than my own have been. She closed her eyes and shook her head. It's too late now anyway. They just kicked me out of town. What? Why can't you just become a... a come to a compromise? Change things around so everybody's happy? I said in the normal stupid way I can suggest the obvious sometimes, face hoofing as I continued. I bet you already tried that. Sorry. I'm not normally this dumb, just completely out of my mind from the explosion. Don't worry, I could kind of tell that already, Solemn said with a little light-hearted tone in her voice. And it was a good suggestion. The problem is that every single one of them wanted to have it go their way. None of them could even agree with each other. She crossed her hooves as she sat. It's just hopeless. I just don't get how to make any of my ideas any better. Well, do you even like any of their ideas? Brass offered hesitantly. I mean, if you liked one of their ideas, would you consider using it? She shook her head. If I use one of their ideas, the others might take it as favoritism, which only spawns more arguments. Solemn got to her hooves again, pacing back and forth. And in using one of their ideas, I feel like it's no longer my story to tell. I need to have that feeling in order to write up a chapter correctly at all. Then, make them follow your plot. I responded firmly. You can't let them change what happens because you think it might be better. You need to stick to your convictions and have them line up with you or leave. I tried to present myself boldly to convey my seriousness. When Shirley learned that she had mentally scarred Noteworthy when they were younger, did she take the easy route and not try to patch things up? No. When Barry Punch kept trying to hurt herself because she was tired of it all, did Cheerley just stand back and let that happen? No. 
With each suggestion, a faint flicker of hope in Solemn's eyes sparked up, growing brighter and brighter. So, you think it's that easy? She put her hoof up to her muzzle in thought, glancing intently at the ground as she lost herself in thought. You think I just need to buck up and fight for it, what I think is right, like Cheerly would? I looked over to Brass and smiled with him, nodding. Well then, maybe you're right. Solemn stood tall as her confidence returned to her voice, the flame of purpose blazing brightly in her eyes. I ran things on my own to start well enough, and I can do so again if I need to. She looked over to me as a smile grew over her muzzle. Thank you for giving me a kick in the flank that I needed, but now if you'll excuse me, I have some writing to do. She trotted forward and around me, stopping at the top of the hill and looking over to me. Red Wing is another day's trot that way, if you follow the trail. She pointed her hoof over to the set of ridges that ran along the left side of the broadcasting array. I wish you luck on your journey, and I hope that your friends can get you patched up in time for the next chapter. And with a smirk, she took off at a gallop down the hill.